Your Majesties. Your Royal Highnesses. In Bakrafru. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. I thank the Swedish Academy for finding my work worthy of this highest honor. In my heart, there may be some doubt that I deserve the Nobel Award over other men of letters whom I hold in respect and reverence. But there is no question of my pleasure and pride in having it for myself. It is customary for the recipient of this award to offer personal or scholarly comment on the nature and the direction of literature. At this particular time, however, I think it would be well to consider the high duties and the responsibilities of the makers of literature. Such is the prestige of the Nobel Award and of this place where I stand that I am impelled not to squeak like a grateful and apologetic mouse, but to roar like a lion out of pride in my profession <laughs> and in the great and good men who have practiced it through the ages. Literature was not promulgated by a pale, emasculated critical priesthood singing their litanies in empty churches. Nor is it a game for the cloistered elect, the tin-horned mendicants of low-calorie despair. Literature is as old as speech. It grew out of human need for it, and it has not changed except to become more needed. The skulls, the bards, the writers, are not separate and exclusive. From the beginning, their functions, their duties, their responsibilities have been decreed by our species. Humanity has been passing through a gray and desolate time of confusion. My great predecessor, William Faulkner, speaking here, referred to it as a tragedy of universal fear, so long sustained that there were no longer problems of the spirit, but only the human heart in conflict with itself, seemed worth writing about. Faulkner, more than most men, was aware of human strength as well as of human weakness. He knew the understand that understanding, understandably, I have been reading the life of Alfred Nobel. A solitary man, the books say, a thoughtful man. He perfected the release of explosive forces, capable of creative good or of destructive evil, but lacking choice ungoverned by conscience or judgment. Nobel saw some of the cruel and bloody misuses of his inventions. He may even have foreseen the end result of his probing, access to ultimate violence, to final destruction. Some say that he became cynical, but I do not believe this. I think he strove to invent a control, a safety valve. I think he found it finally only in the human mind and the human spirit. To me, his thinking is clearly indicated in the categories of these awards. They are offered for increased and continued knowledge of the man and of his world, for understanding and communication, which are the functions of literature, and they are offered for demonstrations of the capacity for peace, the culmination of all the others. Less than 50 years after his death, nature was unlocked. The door of nature was unlocked, and we were offered the dreadful burden of choice. We have usurped many of the powers we want to ascribe to God. Fearful and unprepared, we have assumed leadership over the life or death of the whole world, of all living things. The danger and the glory and the choice rest finally in man. The test of his perfectibility is at hand. Having taken godlike power, we must seek in ourselves for the responsibility and the wisdom we once prayed some deity might have. Man himself has become our greatest hazard and our only hope. So that today, St. John the Apostle may well be paraphrased. In the end is the word, and the word is man, and the word is with men. Thank you.